Today is day three of Stoic Week 2014. And day two, we looked at Cicero and some of his discussions of, of Stoicism and the Stoic paradoxes. Day three, we're going to look at Seneca. And Seneca wrote a lot of important works and a lot of interesting letters. The work of his that I want to focus on today is on anger, the De Ira. And the reason why I'm focusing on that in particular is because I do a lot of my own research on the history of anger and philosophical, psychological, theological, literary views on it. And Seneca is one of the people who really is at the heart in the ancient world of discussions on anger. Now, one reason for that is because he represents the Stoic position and he writes an entire work about it, as opposed to, say, Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus, where we have to do a bit of you know, digging and putting things together to, to come up with a composite picture. In this work, he's focused specifically on anger. He's not the only person to do this in ancient times. There were some other philosophers who also have treatises on anger. But he is the one who really holds the most influence, I would say. And he's representing a Stoic position against what we can call two other allied positions. There's the position of what we might call common culture, not only of the ancient world, but it pervades the medieval world and the early modern world, and even you know many of our, our cultures today, which see anger as something that's, that's often bad, but also something that can have some useful role. And Seneca wants to reject that. The Stoics in general did that. Even Cicero, who's not fully a Stoic, adopts the Stoic position on this and says that anger is just, you know, across the board a bad thing. So there's this common experience that we have of, of getting mad, of losing our tempers, and of thinking, well, you know, they had it coming, or in this case it's okay. And Seneca wants to resist that. And part of what he's going to do in this is to try to provide an argument uh, a whole set of reasons why anger can't be a good or a useful thing for us. He's also targeting the Aristotelians. He mentions Aristotle, and he also mentions one of Aristotle's followers, Theophrastus, who's another peripatetic. So he's going after an entire school, and the Aristotelian school is particularly interesting when it comes to, to anger, because not only did they think that anger could in fact be a good thing, and even necessary in some circumstances, they devoted more attention than most of the other schools to discussing how anger works, how, how it arises, how it can be directed, whether, you know, and in what cases it's actually virtuous. Aristotle actually has a virtue of, uh, we translate it as calmness or good temper, but it does involve getting angry at times. So he's targeting the Aristotelians because they're really the other dominant school when it comes to this. When it comes to, you know, say the Epicureans or the Skeptics or the, the Platonists, they're all pretty much in agreement with the Stoics that anger, eh, not, not a very good thing. The Epicureans very clearly think that it's a bad thing. But Aristotle is, you know, if you want to take on somebody who thinks that anger could be a good thing, he's the guy to do that with. So that's what Seneca's up to. And he's asking and addressing some questions in this. How can anger be calmed? That's the question that he begins with. Now, does he actually provide an answer to that right away? If you read the work, you'll find out, no. He goes on to all sorts of other issues and discourses, which are very interesting and very important. Um, so that leads us to these other questions, and, and this is one of the ones that he considers. Is anger something good? Is it something that could be right or even reasonable? That's a position that Aristotle was taking, and that's a position that even Plato almost seems to take when he makes thumos, which can be translated as anger, the spirited part of the soul, the part of us that gets angry, the auxiliary of, of the reasonable part of the soul. For the Stoics, that's not going to be a good idea. So that's a question that he has to consider, and he, he considers it by addressing people who are saying that, at least in some circumstances, anger is something good, or it is right, or it is reasonable. Now, in order to make sense of this, we also have to ask the question, and this is one of the reasons why this is such an interesting text, and why it can be useful for people today in thinking about their own anger, 
How does anger actually work? How does anger interface with the rest of the human being? Is it something totally irrational that we can't resist at all? Is it under our control to some degree? How does it actually work? So that's one of the things he's going to explore. And then there's this theme that's running through the entire work. He's not just saying that anger is a bad thing. He's saying that for human beings, anger is, as I put here in capital letters, the worst of all the passions and all the vices. So these are some you know, classic Stoic positions on this, this very important and complicated and troubling emotion that we all feel that pervades culture throughout pretty much every culture that we look at throughout history probably is something we're going to struggle with even in the centuries and millennia to come because it's part of the human condition. Now Seneca as a Stoic thinks that we can in fact make progress with respect to this. Anger can be calmed. We can get it under control. A little bit of, uh, of not so much backstory but self-disclosure here when it comes to this, when it comes to this particular issue, I'm, like I said before, if I'm attracted to Stoicism, I'm attracted to it in much the same way that Cicero was, where I, I'm an eclectic, I draw from this school and that school and this school. And when it comes to anger, I have to admit that I'm actually more of an Aristotelian than I am a Stoic. But I'm going to present Seneca's views here and try to keep my own as, as much out of the, the picture as possible, because that's the way I do philosophy. When I, when I present these sorts of things, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what the author thought and what we can cull out of it and, and what sense there is. We can only begin to judge them and say whether they're right or wrong when we fully understand them. Now, I suppose that, that, actually, that brings up another point that's important to, to lay out. I'm not going to try to give you a, a review of the entire work. I'm going to pick out some of the key points from each of the three books that, that comprise this, this text. So there, there's more to this than what I'm laying out here, but I'm going to give you some of the, the key points, some of the ones that I found most interesting. I think it's a very good idea to, uh, you know, if you watch this video, to go to the work and read it yourself and see what you make of it. Seneca introduces a lot of important ideas about anger, how it works, how we ought to judge it in book one. He doesn't work all of them entirely through. They're going to go into book two and book three as well. But he's laying the groundwork. And here he is really targeting the, the Aristotelians and the people involved in you know, Greco-Roman culture, which was a, a you know, fairly honor-driven um, society and, and culture really across the, the Mediterranean, much the way most ancient cultures were. And he's beginning by saying anger is actually a short madness. And we'll come back to that passage in a moment. There is another passage that I want to bring up that, that occurs towards the end of book one, where he is contrasting anger and reason or rationality. He says that reason, when you have a conflict, gives each side, each, each side time to plead. Moreover, she herself demands adjournment, meaning reason likes to think things out, to take, take the time that's necessary, that she may have sufficient scope for the discovery of the truth. Anger is in a hurry. Why? Reason wants to give a just decision. Reason is motivated by finding out what's actually the case, what's true, and then uh, commanding in, in accordance with that. Anger, he says, wishes its decision to be thought just. So instead of actually seeking justice, anger imposes this demand that what it's doing ought to be regarded as just. Reason looks no further than the matter at hand. Anger is excited by empty matters hovering on the outskirts of the case. How often have we had the experience uh, being angry about one thing and then finding ourselves angry about all sorts of other things, bringing up things that are irrelevant, that uh, don't really contribute to, to understanding anything, but, but allow us to feel angry. He says, um, it's irritated by anything approaching to a confident demeanor, a loud voice, an unrestrained speech, dainty apparel, high-flown pleading, or popularity with the public. And he goes on 
and on. And then he says a little bit later, irascibility, irascibility is the vice of getting angry too easily, has this fault. It is reluctant to be ruled. It is angry with the truth itself if it comes to light against its will. And I think this is something that we can all relate to if we think about our experience when we do get angry. Have we ever gone further than we, we ought to? Reason sets down limits. So when we say that anger is actually a short madness, that it's irrational, part of what we mean is that it doesn't respect limits at the very moment that it's trying to lay down limits. It doesn't respect the law when it's trying to lay down the law to everybody else. Now, there's a number of different points here that we, we want to discuss, and I'll, I'll refer to certain passages that are particularly relevant or interesting. One of the things that he considers, is anger something that we have in common with the other animals? And Seneca actually says no. They have things that look like anger, but anger itself is a distinctively human emotion, and it's a distinctively human vice. He says that, that animals may have fury, they may um, you know, threaten each other, they, they engage in aggressiveness, but they don't get angry like we human beings do. If you, you know, if you threaten a dog, or you pull its tail, or you do things like take away its food, it will get something like angry with you, but it can calm itself fairly quickly once the stimulus is gone, he says. You know, I don't think that Seneca has in mind, you know, war dogs or, or fighting dogs or anything like that, where some sort of training would be involved. But even then, I think he would think that's something different than human anger. Human anger has a much greater potential to spill over and to last and to linger and to become something like a vice. There's the passion of getting angry and then, you know, following that out. And then over time, if we don't figure out how to manage our anger properly, we will become vicious with respect to anger. We will become irascible people, he says. And he discusses the difference between these. Um, a little bit early on, he says that um, the difference between anger and irascibility is the same as that between a drunken man and a drunkard. So what does he mean by that? Well, we, we get angry, and that's something that overcomes us, but not all of us are habitually drunk. We're not all, we don't all have that, that weakness. An irascible person is somebody who's angered very easily, or can't let go of their anger, or turns it into passive aggressivity, or, you know, we can come up with a whole bunch of different examples. And he actually says, look, the Greeks recognize all these different kinds of anger. I'm not going to try to enumerate them. You can go to other texts and find that sort of thing. But, you know, there's, here's some examples of it. Um, so we want to avoid falling into this, this kind of pattern. If we want to do that, part of what we, we need to, to address are some philosophical questions. So one of these is, is anger in accordance with nature? And, you know, when the Stoics talk about being in accordance with nature, they don't mean, is it something that comes about just because of our natural dispositions or our genetics or the kind of beings that we are. They're talking about a fully realized human nature, the kind of thing that we can be when we're at our best when we're actually functioning well. So is anger part of that? Now Aristotle said that anger would be part of properly functioning, fully developed human nature. That there are circumstances in which the virtuous person, the person who's actually, you know, living out the, the good life, will get angry. They won't be very often, but they will occur. Seneca says, no, that, that's not the case. He says, Think about human nature. What is man's nature like? What is more gentle when it's in its proper condition? Yet what is more cruel than anger? So there's a, a discord there. When things are going well, we're actually one of the gentlest of all creatures. When things aren't going well, when we're not realizing our human potential, we can be extremely cruel, more cruel than any of the other beasts. 
So he says, um, what is more affectionate to others than man? We're capable of things that, you know, do come from our animal nature. Animals are affectionate with each other, but we go far beyond that. So he says, what is more savage against them than anger? Mankind is born for mutual assistance, anger for mutual ruin. So for Seneca, anger is not really part of our nature in the sense of the way that we ought to be, what we ought to take as our, our guidepost. So the answer to this one is no. Anger is not in accordance with nature. It's actually most out of, out of uh, harmony with it. So here's a more interesting question. Granted that it's not in accordance with our nature, could anger ever be right because it's actually useful? Does this passion serve some useful purpose? And this is a, a much more difficult question, and it's the one that's also more tempting for us. I mean, we're, we're tempted to say, yeah, I got angry because that's just the way it is for human beings to, you know, to err as human, blah, 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 all those sorts of excuses that we make. Here's where it gets more difficult, because it often does feel, doesn't it? Like, I really ought to get angry in this circumstance. If I don't, then what? People are going to take advantage of me or I'm going to let somebody down, or those bad people are going to get away with what they're doing, or I'm going to send them the message that what they're doing is actually okay and they should do it some more. Think about, you know, is anger a good response to bullying or seeing somebody else bullied? These are really valid concerns, and they were just as troublesome back in the ancient period as they remain today for us. So he asks, um, can anger be right because it's useful? It rouses the spirit and excites it. Courage does nothing grand in war without it, unless its flame be supplied from this source. Well, this is something that a lot of people were, were saying, uh, not, you know, not just the Aristotelians, but going back into ancient Greek and Roman culture, that really it's good to get angry at your enemy because that's going to allow you to fight them. It's going to allow you to resist evil, to stand up for what's, what's in need of defending. Is this really the case, though? Seneca says. He says, we've got to be really careful. And here's how he reframes this question. Can reason make good use of this passion? Or does it really end up being kind of a hindrance? So Seneca says, it's easier to banish dangerous passions than to rule them. If we say, yeah, I'm going to let myself get angry because then reason can use that part of us. And this is what Plato was saying. And this is what Aristotle also says. Um, reason can use that part and make sure that it doesn't go too far. Well, anger is a little bit different than some of the other passions. It has a tendency to go off on its own. That's why Plato actually makes that part of the soul a separate part from the one that feels most of the other emotions. Aristotle says that anger is almost unique among the emotions. They're recognizing something here. It has a capacity to subvert and to seduce rationality. Seneca is, is highlighting that. It says, reason who holds the reins is only strong when she remains apart from the passions. So it's not going to actually be that, all that helpful to get angry in order to spur yourself to do the right thing. He says, look, anything that you can do while you're angry, you can also make yourself do because you recognize it to be the right thing. And that's all these sorts of questions that, that are going to be raised uh, along with it by the Aristotelians. He's bringing up Aristotle and Theophrastus here. So let's consider each of these in turn. Maybe it's necessary to get angry against enemies, to protect people, your friends, your family those who you identify with, those who you see being abused by other people, to defend them, or even to, you know, settle scores. He, he brings up, if somebody kills your father, shouldn't you get angry with that person so that you can take, you know, the proper revenge or retribution to honor your parents? He says, well, and this is a, a typical Stoic response, you don't have to have anger to do that. Filial piety which is a virtue, that can have you do that as well. You don't need to feel angry. You don't need to be under the spell of that emotion 
in order to do the right thing, it might, you know, in some ways help, but in other ways it's really going to hinder you because it's going to blind you to what you ought to do. So he goes on and says, um, our attacks when we're fighting enemies ought not to be disorderly, but to be regulated and under control. He uses examples of fighting the barbarians who easily get angry, and gladiators, when gladiators are fighting and they get angry, they let their guard down and they get killed. He says, to feel anger on behalf of one's friends does not show a loving, but actually a weak mind. It is admirable and worthy conduct to stand forth as the defender of one's parents, children, friends, and countrymen at the call of duty itself, acting of one's own free will, not being mastered by some sort of passion. So, the answer to that is no. We don't need anger in order to defend what needs to be defended. Theophrastus, who's an Aristotelian, brings up a typical Aristotelian point. He says, a good person is going to get angry when he sees bad people doing bad things. He says, it's impossible for a good man not to be angry with bad men. And here Seneca says something really interesting. Well, if that's the case, why aren't you angry with yourself? Are you a good man? Are you a good person? Is there anything in you that shouldn't be changed? That's, you know, are, are you completely perfect across the board? Or have you screwed up? If you're like me, he's saying, and I'm also saying this myself, you screwed up plenty. And so you should be angry at yourself because you're not a good man or a good woman, a good child, good whatever. But you're not, are you? So perhaps you shouldn't be so angry with everybody else. And he's going to repeat this point a little bit later on. If you're going to be angry with people because they commit faults, you're going to be angry with the entire world. And you're going to be angry all the time. Is that a sign of moral goodness, to be angry all the time? No, that doesn't make sense, he says. Instead, if we want to make good judgments, because that's part of what Theophrastus is getting at, he's saying anger ought to be a response, a value response, to seeing things that are unjust, that are, that are unfair, that are that are cruel, that are uh, malicious. But it's better to be able to distinguish using reason, he says. To separate what is useless from what is sound is an act not of anger, but of reason. What about punishing people? Maybe we, we need anger as a good response to punish the wicked, to, to let them know, hey, this isn't okay what you're doing, to give them a, a message. And... What does Seneca say? Again, is it possible to do that without getting angry? Can you punish people without being upset with them, but because it's what they need or because it's the right thing to do? Yes, it's quite possible. As a matter of fact, if you're getting angry with people, Seneca says, it's probably going to be counterproductive. You're not actually getting your point home to them. So, all of this points us towards anger not being a good or right or desirable response. In large part because it keeps you from actually living out the kind of life that you ought to be living as a Stoic, that is a, a rational life, a life that is self-controlled, where you're doing the right thing because you actually choose the right thing, not just because your emotions or your habits or your patterns of behavior and attitude compel you. Really one of the key questions that we want to ask ourselves when it comes to anger is how does the process work? Because that reveals to us what role we ourselves have in how we end up feeling and then how we end up behaving. So anger is something that is roused by the appearance of injury or wrong that's done to ourselves or done to those that we care about or identify with. And it doesn't necessarily have to be actual injury that's being done. It could be just threatened, because even that, as, as uh, Seneca points out, is to sort of arouse in the person's mind, in their perception, the, the notion that something is going to happen like that. So here we have the you know, stoic 
focus on appearances. What do we do in relation to these appearances? And Seneca is going to ask, is this an automatic process? Does, does the anger automatically follow this appearance that we, we run across? Or is our mind in some way involved? And this is really important because if our mind is involved, that means that we're not totally at prey of this, that we can make some sort of intervention. It may not be in a particularly effective intervention in many cases. We might catch ourselves a little bit too late. We might not, you know, have the right things uh, ready at hand. There, there are ways in which we can take care of our anger. I'm not going to talk so much about that, although he goes into that in, in this book, and also in uh, some parts in book one, and also in book three. There's two main things that I want to focus on here in order to keep this a little bit shorter um, than the treatment of book one. One is that anger is complex, he says. He says, um, the Stoics' opinion is anger can venture on nothing of itself without the approval of mind. Now, why is that the case? Because mind has to, has to put together these two notions, these two propositions, as he says. Um, we ought not to have been injured or insulted or attacked or threatened, whatever it is that we want to say, and we ought to avenge our injuries. This doesn't logically follow from this, and it doesn't follow by any sort of automatic process either. It's our minds, it's our reasoning processes that we're often not completely conscious of, but we can become aware of, that connects these two. And this is a little bit of backstory here that, that's not being brought up too much here, but it's useful to, to think about this. For the Stoics, emotions, which we actually feel, are at the same time also thoughts. They're judgments about things. So the feeling and the thought are kind of two sides of the same coin. They're bound together. So these correspond to feelings. We feel wronged. We feel injured. And then we also feel this impulse to respond, to fight back, to avenge ourselves, to impose something, uh, impose some suffering on somebody else. He actually says Aristotle defines anger, and he's oversimplifying here a bit, as the wish to impose suffering in return upon another. That's from Aristotle's topics, actually. He says, I'll, I'll go along with that. I think that's actually correct. So anger does involve a desire, which is the flip side of, of a judgment. So he says, the impulse is a simple act, but this is a complex one, composed of several parts. The person understands something to have happened, he becomes indignant at that, he condemns the deed, and he avenges it. All of this happens because we, we think our way through it. Often, again, not being conscious of like sitting down and going through a discursive process. It's happening. It feels automatic, but there's actually a reasoning process that we can observe and intervene with it. So let's look at the process involved. Um, Seneca says there's, there's three steps to this. First, there's some sort of impulse and perception, and we'll talk a little bit more about that because I just want to lay this out very quickly. And he says that's actually involuntary. We don't control whether you know, somebody bumps into us or whether we read a book and, and you know, something in the book offends us or anything along those lines. That happens, right? We don't control that. To, to go to the you know, classic Stoic uh, distinction between things that are in our power and things that are not in our power, that's not in our power. Then, this wish to avenge ourself, this, this response that, that arises from it, that's something distinct. That we do have control over, at least to some degree. Uh, if, we, if we're already coming to it with a lot of bad habits formed, we have a little bit less control because those habits do some of the process of getting us from point one to point three uh, without us, you know, if we're not paying attention to it. Uh, but once we become aware of our own involvement in it, this is where we can actually intervene because this is voluntary. We can think other things. We don't have to be... Um, you know, angry when we are, or when we do get angry, we can try to oppose other things to it. He says, better to laugh or to cry than to be angry, for example. Then there's the actual passion. And once it gets to this point, the third point, we're, we're screwed. 
it's the train has, has left the station and it's heading down the track and you're not going to pull it back um, unless you you know something happens you know somebody like pulls you up short and says and knock it off and then you're back at stage two where you could actually think about it but so long as the passion is driving you you're you're pretty much out of control your reason has been overridden if there is rationality operating, if it's not just complete insanity, as Seneca seems to think, then reason gets harnessed and is turned into the slave of that passion, to use you know, Hume's term. So he says um, that, uh, going back to this first part, it's not actually a passion itself, but a rudiment, he says, a, a beginning that can grow into a passion. So, you know, what are some examples of this? He says, a soldier starts at the sound of a trumpet, even though he may be dressed as a civilian in the midst of profound peace. Camp horses prick up their ears at the clash of arms. It, we, there's things that rile us up, that, that get us going. And he says, um, none of these things which, which uh, casually influence the mind deserve to be called passions. The mind, if I may so express it, rather suffers passions to act upon itself rather than forms them. So, it's not the things that are presented to us, but it's what we do with them that's going to cause the passion. He says, it's not being affected by the sights which are presented to us, but in giving way to our feelings and following up on these promptings. Um, so this first emotion is involuntary. The next, he says, is combined with a wish, a volition, a choice on our part. And again, this is where we actually have some capacity to intervene, and we were better prepared for that if we actually realize that this is something we have control over. If we pretend to ourselves that we don't, that I just feel my feelings and that's all there is to it, then we're stuck with the process, and there's really nothing we can do about it. But that's to um, be you know, less of a a human being and more like a, a machine composed of meat and, and bones and nerves and brain cells, I suppose. So he says, um, it's the, 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 the wish is, it's my duty to avenge myself or it's right that this man should be punished. We can have all sorts of judgments involved there. Then he says the third emotion is already beyond our control and we're not able to do anything about that. So we actually do have um, some capacity. Now, one of the other things that he does say that I do want to bring up here is if we want to control this, one of the ways we can do that is by providing ourselves with what he calls maxims. And a maxim is a very short formulation. So something like, well, I actually care about these people, and if I care about them, I should not get angry with them, or I should not act upon my anger, that could be a good maxim. Um, another one might be, it doesn't do much good to punish while I'm angry. Or, one of the things that they teach you in anger management, um, when I become angry, I become stupid. If you can tell yourself that right here, you might actually be able to keep from turning this into an automatic process. Book three is quite long, and there's a lot going on in it. I'm just going to hit on a few points to sort of bring this to a close. And the ones that I'm going to focus on are the ones that I think are perhaps the most useful to us in our contemporary situation. Uh, again, I, I highly suggest reading this book for yourself, going through it, seeing what else is in it, um, coming to your own judgments about it. But I'm going to focus here on one of the key issues that, that Seneca is concerned with, which is... Granted that part of the process of getting angry and, and behaving like an angry person has this moment or, or, or part where we can actually intervene and if we're doing it over time to sort of reshape our character, reshape our patterns, um, start to move ourselves in different directions, how do we actually do that? What are, you know, we've talked about maxims already, giving yourself some some good advice from time to time, but that's awfully tough to do once you start getting angry, isn't it? So are there any other things that we can do that would help us out? And he says that one of the things that we need to do 
is actually prove angers, and he's got a whole bunch of things here. It's inappropriateness. He says unseemliness, but we would nowadays call that inappropriateness. It's ferocity. It's, it's ugliness. How damaging, how irrational, how counterproductive anger is. And we can do that by looking at examples, but we can also think about sort of general patterns. He has a really interesting suggestion, which is take an angry person and put them in front of a mirror so they can actually see what they look like. We, nowadays, we might, you know, use a video camera or a voice recording. And when the angry person can actually see and hear how they sound and look, sometimes that's enough to jar them out of it. Sometimes not. Sometimes it can have an intensifying effect as well. Now, why do we need to do this? He says we need to prove this. Because there's those Aristotelians out there that are saying anger is a good thing. So we, we have to counter them. Um, but, you know, uh, we don't have to be Aristotelians. There's all sorts of cultural um, fields in which anger is regarded as the right response. Where if you don't get angry, you're not macho, or you're not standing up for yourself, or you're giving in to injustice. So we, we want to think about what is the cost of, of anger. Um, so he says we should focus on anger's connection and comparison with the other vices. Now here's where the Stoics really do depart from most of the other schools of philosophy. In thinking that anger is the worst, he says that um, let's compare it with the worst vices. Avarice, greed, scrapes together and amasses riches for some, uh, some better man to use. Anger spends money. Few can indulge in it for nothing. How many servants does an angry master drive to run away or to commit suicide? How much more he loses by his anger than the value of what he originally became angry about? Anger brings grief to a father, divorce to a husband, hatred to a magistrate, failure for a candidate for office. It is worse than luxury or self-indulgence with respect to pleasures. Why? Luxury enjoys its own pleasure. Anger enjoys another's pain. And we can go on. He says it's even worse than spitefulness, which that's a stretch. I mean, here he's clearly at odds with, with Aristotle and with Plato. Being spiteful just for its own sake, just hurting somebody for its own sake, is for the Stoic not as bad as getting angry. Because when, you, when you're getting angry, you're actually screwing up two people, yourself and that other poor, poor guy that you're angry at. Um, whereas spitefulness, I suppose, <laughs> there's less going on there. Um, so he, he gives a whole bunch of examples of this. And then he says, if we compare it with the other virtues, the other virtues are going to demand that we don't get angry. Great souledness, for example. The great souled person doesn't get angry easily at other people. So that's another thing that we can do. Now, can you do that in a, in a situation? Probably not. So that's something that would have to be part of your discipline. That's part of the reshaping of character involved. Another thing we can do, now this is a little bit more preparatory. This doesn't help us out in actual situations so much, but it's a matter of avoiding situations where we're going to, or occasions, where we're going to get ourselves angry. He says, um, whenever, you would first attempt, whenever you would attempt anything, first form an estimate, think about um, what's actually possible for you, of your own powers, your own capacities, your own talents, your own resources. Also form an understanding of the extent of the matter which you're undertaking, and of the means which you have to undertake it. One of the ways we get easily angered is when we want to do something, and we start doing it, and then things go wrong. I know for me, great example, um, technology. You know, the, the lighting can be bad, and, and I, I do the video, and I, I get it done, and the lighting is terrible, and I'm, I'm getting upset now, because I wanted to get that done during a certain time, and now I have to reshoot it. Um, a train goes by, making a lot of noise. I, you know, I can get angry at the train because of that. If I were to practice the sort of thing that, that Seneca is talking about, I should think ahead of time before I do anything. This could go wrong this way. This could go wrong this way. What am I going to do? What are my resources for, for dealing with that? So that's, that's one important thing. He says, um, since we also don't do well with, with you know, taking stuff from other people that we don't like, let's make sure that we don't have to. 
We should live with the quietest and easiest tempered persons, not with anxious or sullen ones. Let's avoid the passive aggressive people as our friends or in the workplace. Um, now, obviously, you, you only have a certain amount of control over who you associate with. Um, you know, as they say, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. You also pretty much can't pick your workmates either, can you, unless you decide to change a job. Um, and even friends, you know, it's, there's, 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 it's tough to let old friends go, isn't it? But there could be people that are not good for us to associate with. Some of those people will be the people who do get angry or hold on to their anger too long uh, because they're going to they're gonna sort of reinforce our own bad tendencies. We want to spend our time with people who are going to be good role models for us in how to deal with our own anger rather than those who are going to intensify it. He also has another really interesting suggestion here. Irascible people, that is people who have a, a vice with respect to anger, ought not to meddle in the more serious class of occupations, or at least ought to stop short of weariness in the pursuit of them. Their mind ought not to be engaged on hard subjects, but handed over to the pleasing arts. Um, so he would say, you know, look, with respect to philosophy, for example, if you're an angry person, you probably don't want to go and get a PhD in philosophy because there's going to be a lot of things along the way that are going to tick you off. You probably shouldn't get into politics, even if you think that anger could be a useful device for getting into politics and getting people to listen to you, because, man, you're going to be angry all the time. There's probably a whole bunch of other things that you shouldn't get into. And if you do, then you should take some steps to minimize the, the spillover that's going to happen when you do get angry, when you lose your temper. So these are all useful bits of advice. He's got other things here as well. He talks about a lot of examples. Um, but I think that's probably sufficient to give you a, a good understanding of what's going on in this classic text on anger. Uh, really wonderful work by this great Stoic philosopher, Seneca. And uh, that's where we'll wrap up.